Are you confused on what you want to be when you grow up? Curious to see what different careers are really like? Don't worry, you're not alone. Explore and find your passions with By Youth for Youth. Access to knowledge, opportunity for exploration. A video and podcast series run by youth for youth. Hi, I'm Sunny. I'm Sahana. And I'm Nivi. And we are By Youth for Youth. Hi everyone, it's Sunny, and today we're here with Claire Derner, who is the Director of Sustainability at DePau University. Um, hi Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, can you just start off with like describing your job? So my job is the Director of Sustainability at DePa. I do a couple different things. My main job and the best part of my job is working with the Sustainability Leadership Program, which is a group of um, anywhere from 50 to 90 students, depending on how big the semester gets. And they complete different sustainability initiatives through our working groups like Zero Waste, Climate Justice, and our farm group, because we do have a campus farm that provides food for the dining hall here at DePa. I also um, work on the sustainability committees and I look into things like how to achieve carbon neutrality at DePa, things like that. So I get to do a lot with my job and I have a lot of flexibility with it. That's super cool. So do you spend like more time in the field then like rather than like desk work? Um, I actually have a farm manager who's my main other coworker. He does more of the farm work and the field work. I tend to be the person at the office. Well, my office here is actually um, a big farmhouse. It's very cool, but it's I do most of the desk work, but I also get to um, do a lot of activities with the students and plan a lot of meetings. So working with the students is probably like pretty rewarding. What's like the most impactful experience you've had with the student or like a breakthrough, I guess? So I started this position in August of 2020. So I'm pretty new to it. I've only done one semester with the students, but I would say, you know, with COVID, we have been doing all of our meetings on Zoom and a lot of students are remote. So I think it was really rewarding to see students realize through our meetings that they can still complete sustainability projects this year, even though COVID is going on. I think that was a big relief for them because it's just been a really hard year. And I don't think anyone was very excited to go back to college the same way that they were previously. So that's really important to me is letting them know that they can still have fun and they can still accomplish their goals. What are some of those sustainability or sustainable projects that they like complete, like being remote? Right. So like I mentioned, we have some various working groups and those are student led and the projects are student designed. I like to think of myself as more of a facilitator for the projects to help them um, get into community contacts or um, get funding, things like that. So for instance, our zero waste group, they wanted to do a zero waste recipe book. And I encouraged them to think not only about the small stuff like um, reducing water when we're doing our laundry or showering, whatever, like those typical things you hear about that are more on the individual. Um, they're also creating recipes for systemic change and thinking sort of on a large scale with how um, corporations end up contributing to a lot of the reasons that our lives are so wasteful. So that's one example. Or um, luckily the farm group does get to be in person. And so they get to harvest vegetables. And like I mentioned before, all those vegetables end up either being donated to the community or going straight into the food in the dining hall, which is really good for students. Um, and there's a lot of ed information in the dining hall about where their food comes from. And it just gives them a taste of what localizing food can be like. That's so cool. I think that those types of projects, I feel like I see all these different projects that people do, but I feel like it's hard to choose like a starting point or like find ways to like help with environmental sustainability. What do you suggest to people who want to help the environment but don't know where to start? Um, that's a tough one because I've kind of always paid attention to it ever since I was younger, but I would say you know, for me, I am more focused on the people aspect of sustainability. I'm less focused on the conservation or the hard science part of it. So for me, um, I would recommend going into your community and finding all those places where 
you can still exist for free, which are getting a lot smaller. You know, you can go to a park and see what the community members like to do. You can go to the library and see what kind of programs there are. I remember when I was in college, I went to Indiana University. I went to the library for what they had um, mending days. And that was where you could go and there were older women who had sewing machines and they would help you repair your clothing and then teach you how to do it yourself. And that taught me um, skills like about self-sufficiency and how to encourage others. And now applying that to my job here, I hope to use some of our budget for some sewing machines this semester so I can help do the same thing for the students. So you can learn a lot from your elders and your community members. I definitely recommend doing that. And that um, mending day kind of reminds me of like fast fashion and how that has been like a pretty prominent topic in media recently. What are ways that you like upcycle your clothes or try to have more sustainable clothing items in your closet? Yeah, so it's funny that you mentioned that because I recently took some kind of quiz where you can measure the footprint of your clothing. And I would say at least 80% of my clothing has been thrifted since I was in about the eighth grade and started as like a way to sort of save my money um, because I had like a certain budget each year that I would be able to spend on clothing and you get more clothes when you're thrifting it. But it sort of turned into realizing that like I can find really good and unique stuff there. Um, so yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. I just learned about the company Thread Up, which has been really helpful for me in the pandemic. I was living with my parents until very recently, so it was important to be very cautious. And so I didn't really go into thrift stores lately or any stores, frankly. So Thread Up is where you can sort by your size and by what you're looking for. And it's pretty affordable clothing that you can just order and it arrives to you and it's all secondhand. So um, the stuff I purchased was anywhere from like $5 to $30, but some of it was originally like over $100. So that was a really good resource. Learning basic sewing skills. You don't need a sewing machine to fix your clothing. You just need some thread and a needle and a YouTube video, honestly. Um, and being gentle with your clothing. I always end up washing my clothing really gently in cold water and air drying it when I need to. So I have a lot of thrifted clothing and, um, I discourage people from reselling clothing um, in a way that's like massive because it takes away resources from people who rely on thrifting for um, their lower income needs and things like that. So I discourage that kind of behavior, but I almost think of myself as sort of renting my clothing because, you know, something like this that I got from a thrift store a few years ago, I buy it for $5, I have it for five years, and then it probably goes back to the thrift store. So. That's actually really cool. Recently, I've been really getting into online thrifting. I don't know, it's kind of a passion of mine. I haven't actually bought anything yet, but um, I've been on this app called Curtsy, which is really similar to ThreadUp. But yeah, that's, I'm also passionate about like sewing clothes and mending my own clothes, because um, I have a sewing machine and that I like to do often instead of just like buying new clothes. Basically. Awesome, that's great. And I recognize that not everyone can thrift their clothing and they yeah. might rely on fast fashion because of the pricing or transportation issues or um, lack of sizing. So I try not to place a lot of guilt on people or their environmental choices because ultimately we all have things that we need to do just to make our quality of life better. Um, so yeah, definitely I encourage people to do what they can and not feel bad about what they can't. What is, does a typical day in your life look like? So, um, I was thinking about this question earlier and my days look a lot different day to day because the academic calendar puts a lot of breaks in. Mm -hmm. And so right now the students at DePauw typically have a winter term. And so I don't get to interact with them right now. Um, mainly what I'm doing is planning and that's almost entirely alone just in my own brain. And it <laughs> is not my favorite part of the job, but it's exciting to think about. So I'm planning our leadership training where our student employees who are in those leadership positions, like leading those working groups, for instance, um, I'm going to be planning a two hour training session where they first of all, get hired and do all this paperwork, but also talk about how to be a good leader, how to lead effective meetings, how to make um, people feel heard and figure out what strengths you have in different individuals in your group and also how to set goals and how to adjust them as your goals change. So um, I'm looking forward to that, but 
Once the semester gets started in February, we have weekly meetings where we have different sustainability speakers talk with us. So I've been um, working on uh, securing those speakers. And also we talk about different sustainability topics of interest. So um, sort of planning that out and seeing what students might be interested in. Okay, so a lot of like what you're doing right now is planning for upcoming projects and like things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you talked about like how the students have research projects. Do you like do research projects of your own or anything like that? That's an interesting question. So I don't do them through DePa necessarily. Like I'm always researching um, people to speak with us. Like for instance, just uh, secured, I think, or I hope um, Lydia Jennings, who is an indigenous soil scientist who will be talking to us about mining practices. So I'm really excited about that. And I did some research to figure out who she was and why her work is important. But um, outside of DePa, I am a volunteer researcher for the Atari lab. And that's a lab that I worked in as a freshman. Um, and it has to do with cognitive behavioral climate change research and focusing on psychology. So the project we're working on right now is looking at if we care about people experiencing the negative impacts of climate change more if they are more like us or more um, unlike us. So if um, I care more about climate change happening to a middle class white woman or if I care more about like a lower income uh, black individual uh, with climate change, that's kind of what we're looking at with that test. And then kind of similar to that question, what other research projects or um, roles have you had like throughout your career, like since the beginning of college or even high school? So at the Atari lab, my freshman year, um, I was a, a 2020 sustainability scholar is what they called it. And I was doing research on if we care more about people experiencing climate change impacts, if they are from our present generation, like a, um, a child in the present versus if we're saying that these impacts are happening to someone in the future. So I looked at it from that angle and there was also a race, um, a race component of that study too. And um, that's about as much research as I did. The other things like the projects I did were through the uh, student government at IU. I did this BAT project where I took reclaimed theater wood from the sets and I turned it into bat boxes and um, I still have some of them and I hope to put them around the nature park at DePauw. We have a pretty big nature park here. Um, and then I was an intern with the Office of Sustainability at one point and I did ACHI STARS reporting. And um, if you're not familiar with STARS, it's basically a way that universities get points for different sustainability actions they do anywhere from like uh, the quality of their campus farm to how much information is on their sustainability website. So um, I did reporting with that and now it comes in handy because I'm doing my own reporting for DePa soon too. So I think that's most of the projects I was a part of, yeah, relating to sustainability. And then also in college, like what were your majors or minors in? Yeah, so I did environmental management with minors in urban planning and law and public policy. Specifically, like the law and public policy, how has that like impacted your career? And like, how is that useful? Um, it's useful because DePa doesn't have a policy, an environmental policy major. So, but um, interestingly enough, students at DePa have a, a very strong history of doing environmental policy work. Um, and that kind of fell off a little bit in the past few years, but it's something I want to bring back. So getting that motivation is um, really helpful. I still have a lot to learn about environmental policy, especially in Indiana specifically. Each legislative system is so different from the next, but um, it helped me build connections. I had students doing research on how different legislators voted on various environmental bills in Indiana through the Hoosier Environmental Council. And so getting students connected with that was really exciting for me last semester. That's so cool. I haven't really, I didn't really think about like environmental policies before and how that could relate exactly with, well, I mean, obviously it relates with environmental sustainability, but I don't think about that as often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. On election night, we had like a big live stream 
um, outdoor event. And I remember they had this like pie chart of what Americans think is the biggest issue in the next like 10 or I don't know how many years, but like climate change or the environment was not one of them. It was like healthcare and coronavirus, like all these very relevant and important things. But uh, the fact that they didn't have an environmental section was really surprising to me. Yeah, that is surprising. I feel like there's always the constant um, issue of climate change and these in issues of environmental sustainability that we always hear of. But I feel like when it comes down to it, a lot of people overlook it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's because it has to do with um, a concept in our lab, like psychological distance. It's very like far in our minds because we don't see it happening to us, maybe necessarily. Maybe there's a really hot day or a really cold day, but um, we don't think about it too much. So. Uh, so you've done a lot of projects, different research. What is the most crazy experience that you've had during your years? Uh, I flew out to D.C. to work with a certain organization and get trained on um, doing, uh, looking at corporate influence and in, uh, higher education donations. And that felt kind of like sneaky because your university doesn't necessarily want you to find out that stuff. It doesn't want you to find out that they're getting money from Exxon Mobil in their uh, School of Environmental Affairs. But uh, learning how to do FOIA requests, which is the Freedom of Information Act. That's basically where you can request to see emails going between people in a public university. That was, you know, really cool because you make some enemies doing that, but you push for the truth in doing that too. And so training other, I ended up founding an organization called Transparent IU that focused on corporate influence in higher education. Um, and that was just really great. It was an awesome initiative and it was a very small tight-knit team that did some cross-oppositional research and I think the most rewarding part of doing it was that we had a new dean of the School of Public and Environmental Affairs being elected or selected in um, to the school during our time when we were running that organization and um, we put out a lot of information about people's backgrounds and their history with the environment and we told people basically if they had conflicts of interest and it ultimately helped with the election of a really good dean of the school now. Outside of work, what do you do in your free time? Like, do you have any hobbies or? Yeah, um, I, so I had been living with my parents for a while. So I feel like some of my hobbies were a little harder to do, but I love to cook a lot. And I also like to do aerial arts. So doing, um, aerial hoop and silks. I really love doing that stuff a lot. And then um, I've been trying to read more this year. That's a big goal of mine, whether it's audiobooks as I'm driving or just like sitting down and reading a book. So, What are you currently reading? <laughs> I'm reading a childhood favorite, The Tale of Despero. I'm like oh. halfway through it. So I've just been reading it on my lunch break. It's just uplifting and happy. But my audiobook right now is um, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. And at the AC virtual conference, he got to, I got to see him speak and that was really cool. So I decided I should read his book. That is super cool. Uh Ishika, if you are ready, we'd love to have you on to ask Claire some questions. Hello, so my name is Ishika and I'm a high school student interested in environmental sustainability. Cool. And I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. So my first question, and these are going to go from like trying to get to know you a little bit better to like more heavy questions. Yeah. So um, my first question for you is um, like what inspired you to get started in this field? And how did you kind of get started? So I think I mentioned before that I have always cared about the environment since I was younger. I grew up outside playing in the woods, but I think I became aware of climate change when I was around 10, which would have been like 2007. And, you know, as a kid, I didn't know much about it. I just knew like polar bears are in trouble and like the earth is getting hotter. That sounds scary, but it's just something I paid attention to. And, you know, I'm actually not a very good test taker. And I struggled in high school to get the grades that my parents wanted me to. And then when I reached college, I realized that it was because I didn't get the chance to study environmental topics. And once I got to college and, and was able to do that, I pretty much um, thrived and did pretty well. So I think realizing that it's what I'm what I enjoy and what I enjoy working really hard at, even when it's difficult, that was 
why I wanted to get into it. And then also just caring about people and community is important to me. I've always wanted to help people, but I've never been the type to want to be a doctor or a teacher, even though I'm almost a teacher now, but I would have never envisioned myself in that situation before. Yeah, it's really interesting you bring up that point because like throughout the interview, I was noticing that like you were really interested in fields that were kind of outside of environmental sustainability, but like they still tied into like helping people. So the question that I want to ask you is, would you ever consider transitioning into like a legal reform career and not like full on lawyer, but like trying to get reform in education or in the way we tr- treat our environment? Um, I would not be against it. I think I would work with like an organization like Hoosier Environmental Council who Um, pays attention to bills and pushes for legislators to uh, be like what we call a climate voter. Uh, So I could see myself doing something like that. Being a full-on lawyer, I think I considered it maybe a long time ago, but um, the system is really set and it's kind of a tough system to work within. So I think it would be kind of hard for me. I like being in um, areas with more flexibility where I can be a little more creative, I think. And um, sort of tackle more unique projects, I think. Yeah, I can relate to that as well. I've, I wanted to be a lawyer and then I realized like this is a very confining career. So I can totally relate to that. Yes. (laughs) Um, And then another question, as you were kind of talking about this earlier, how once you get into a career, you kind of start noticing like that career or that problem, like everywhere. So what Mm -hmm. kind of impact has this job had on you? Um, It's impacted me a lot. When you say that you see it everywhere, do you mean like how I think about the environment now or um, just in general, how it's impacted my life? Like if you ever, um, I guess this is just an example. Like if you became a lawyer, you could start seeing like where everyone is breaking the law everywhere. I guess that's like, <laughs> that's like a bad example, but like something like towards those lines. Um, so this happened before I came into this job, but once I realized the um, role of capitalism in environmental destruction, I saw it everywhere. And it was like very frustrating, but at the same time, a release because I stopped blaming the individual so much and stopped being angry at people around me and more started being um, like, like feeling out that sense of community around me against a unified, like, power that is like, you can target it. You know, you've heard the statistic that like 70 corporations are like, or a hundred corporations are responsible for a vast majority of CO2 emissions, things like that. So the capitalism thing is pretty overwhelming sometimes, but um, yeah, uh, some other ways, let me see. I heard about this. So some other ways this job impacted me, um, I used to be really terrified of public speaking. And so it kind of challenged me and pushed me um, to get out of that box. And then I'm also thinking creatively a lot. I'm thinking outside the box too. I'm thinking ahead for my students and thinking about um, ways that they can do projects differently. I'm looking for inspiration everywhere at other universities and other small towns because Greencastle is a small rural town in Indiana. And yeah, it's, it's almost hard to shut off that switch on the weekends where I'm not thinking about work anymore. And yeah, I think I'm very lucky to work a job that I like and feel like makes an impact in other people's lives. Yeah. Once you're passionate about something, it's really hard to stop thinking about it. So I totally Mm -hmm. get it. And then my, just my last question for you. So people like me, I think like what our number one, like thing is, to not get into environmental sustainability is like, oh, what am I going to do by myself? You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. what are some small ways, some sustainable ways that we could maybe start easing into making our environment better? Because it's a pretty important issue. So I think I also struggled with that issue. Um, Real, like trying to figure out what's the point of it. And it feels very um, overwhelming thinking about climate change, but I think it's about finding a balance of doing that large scale work and doing that small scale work. And that's what I try to do when I'm looking at policy issues in Indiana or beyond, that's one thing. But when I'm helping one student, um, like convince them to get into a leadership role in SLP, which is sustainability leadership program, uh, that's like impactful too. And that still makes a difference in my life. Um, I go basically as small as I can go and 
when you're thinking smaller in terms of gratitude and in terms of good environmental things, there are more of them and it becomes more overwhelming at some point than um, one big issue. Some days it's still hard, but yeah, I hope that makes sense. But like, if I'm going on a walk, I'm really mindful and I'm really present and I'm really tuned into the environment. Or if I'm at my SLP meeting, I'm not thinking about climate change. I'm thinking about what's right there. Um, So that's what I would say as far as that goes. And when it comes to being sustainable on a personal level, um, you know, it's a, it's a, like a buzzing phrase for people to say there, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but that doesn't mean there's no ethics. So I think trying to, um, you know, I have material goods, but I thrift them and that makes me really happy. I, um, eat mainly vegetarian, things like that. And I have no desire for a big house. I would love to live in public housing one day and I would love to uh, take public transportation and not own a car, things like that. Um, But I recognize the hardest thing for me would be to not do plane travel anymore. And um, so I try to balance like the good behaviors with trying to reduce guilt um, as well. You know, sometimes I'll go get fast food that like has high waist, you know, but that's something that's going to keep me happy and get me going through the next day. You know what I mean? So it's kind of balancing that and minimizing that guilt so that you can continue pushing for the overall goal you're working towards um, without, you know, isolating yourself from the society that we actually live in. So I think that's a fantastic way to frame it. So it's much easier for people to get into it. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for your questions. I definitely think it's interesting how you talked about like the guilt you can feel when you aren't doing everything like 100% of what you can do like just because I feel like also another part with starting out like I'm gonna reduce my waist then you also are like wait but I'm still doing this so what's the point and I think that's a really good point that you brought up right I think the more you pay attention to corporate impacts the more you realize that we all would be a lot more sustainable if from the top down, we were being provided products that were packaged that way and that we could consume that way. So it's tough. Um, and I think being empathetic and sympathetic to others who, um, you know, it's like this crazy juxtaposition, like people in other countries that have like very minimal impact when it comes to climate change end up experiencing the brunt of the impacts. Um, And then it comes to like people who are low income often have to eat a lot of fast food or like single packaged items. And it's like, they're making much less impact than a very wealthy person in like a huge house with a bunch of cars, things like that. But it's not framed that way when you just look at it. So yeah, minimizing guilt and being empathetic and just pushing for a way where people don't have to live like that is most important, I think. Yeah, definitely. You talked a little bit about how you're really passionate about your job. So like, it's fun, I guess, or um, yeah, you know what I mean. But what are some ways that you balance like work, home environment? Um, So yeah, it's weird because I just moved into a new place and I'm still figuring that out. But um, exercise is important for me and it keeps me pretty grounded and um now that I don't live with my parents, I would say visiting family also will keep me grounded rather than (laughs) living with them. So um, things like that. And if I want to think about my work, I try to go less for work and more for inspiration. So maybe watching a nature documentary or starting um, a new book. One of my favorite authors is Naomi Klein. She's the author of The Shock Doctrine and um, this changes everything. So reading something like that, where it's like, I can apply it to my work after the weekend, but I don't feel drained by the time I get to Monday, because if you don't take that time to have a break, you're not going to be able to work effectively the next week anyways. Yeah, I definitely think that's something that can translate to any job or even like schoolwork, because if you just keep going, then you get drained out and then it's just no good. Okay, just some last final questions. Uh, How has being a woman in STEM like affected your career path or like, have you encountered any hurdles? Um, I think luckily I have been very welcomed by all of the 
um, older men and women at the university. I started this job when I was 22. I'm 23 now. And um, I had some big shoes to fill. But the last director was a woman, which I'm grateful for because I think it wasn't like a weird transition in that way. And I don't know. I think in this position so far, I haven't experienced anything negative like that. And um, it's almost the opposite. It's almost like I try to use my position of privilege to seek out other um, unique voices to speak at our meetings. Like I mentioned, the indigenous soil scientists, things like that. Um, And yeah, I hope not to encounter those issues, but I'll be prepared when I do. And let me think just because I used to um, work for the Center of Excellence for Women in um, Technology. And I think being in that environment was really helpful for me because I was around a lot of really powerful, um, engaged women. So yeah, I guess I just, I have um, a confidence going into a position like this where uh, even if someone tries to put me down, I'm not going to let them, you know? Yeah, and I definitely think it's great that you're using your position to be vocal, not necessarily, well, vocal, but like uh, bringing out other voices into the conversation. Right. That's been the biggest obstacle so far. It's been less like um, of my own like issues and more of just trying to bring others into the spotlight. Yeah. Uh, And then last question, what is your tagline, like your motto or catchphrase, I guess? Oh, um, I don't know if I have one. But I'll think of one. I'll say community is key. That's what I think, you know. Um, And something I I really do want to say is when it gets overwhelming, uh, thinking about where we are in the world, I think my center of hope is that pushing for a better environment and a better society to sustain our environment pushes for better things when it comes to um, gender issues and race issues and healthcare and housing and drug addiction, like it all, in my opinion, if you do it the right way and push in the right direction, it all complements each other and it all benefits um, one another when you push for that. So yeah, community is key and think outside yourself. And yeah, that's what I would say. (laughs) Okay. Thank you so much, Claire. I think that is all. Thank you so much for listening this week. Tune in for our future episodes every other Thursday and leave us a review down below. Check out our Instagram at BY4YPodcast for career resources and more about this episode. Bye!